Hey everybody, this is Josh Friedman with One Zero Digital Media, and we are filming with Jonathan Ruprecht, who's going to be talking to us on behalf of the Drone Educators Conference at Cal Poly Pomona. Today is February 2nd, 2016, and we'll be showing this at the conference this Saturday on February 6th, 2016. So um, I'm in California right now. Uh, Jonathan, you're in Florida, I believe, correct? Correct. Awesome. So... I'm just going to throw it your way, and I'm going to add some questions, interject uh, as time goes on. Uh, but first, thanks for, for doing this for us, and uh, go right ahead. Tell us what uh, what do schools need to know about drone law, Jonathan Ruprecht. Sure. Let me talk briefly about just you know my background, what about me, uh, you know I'm currently doing and have done. Uh, so. I'm an attorney that focuses specifically on drone law. I'm actually currently involved behind the scenes with the uh, Taylor v. FAA case, the, the three of them going on right now in the D.C. circuit. Uh, my firm was ranked uh, second in the U.S. as of December the 31st for the number of 333 exemption clients. I'm a commercial pilot, and I have two flight instructor certificates that are still current. Went to Emory Riddle Aeronautical University and then went to Florida National uh, University School of Law and obtained my uh, my Juris Doctorate. I've published a book on drones called "Their uh, Their Many Drones, Their Many Civilian Uses in the U.S. Laws Surrounding Them." I also published another book, uh, co-authored another book that's being published currently by the American Bar Association. Uh, it's called "Unmanned Aircraft: The National Airspace Critical Issues, Technology, and the Law." I wrote it on the FAA rulemaking process and also the history of unmanned aircraft. Recently, just published the drone operators uh, logbook, and then coming up here, I'm um, I'm co-authoring a book on drone flight instruction currently, and I'm also uh, going to be publishing another book on the FAA rulemaking process, Part One of Seven, and ICAO. So that, that's what's in the works right now that I'm currently doing. So. Let's talk about the different types of aircraft. Two, you basically break it down into two categories. You have public aircraft, uh, which are fulfilling some type of governmental purpose, such as Air Force One here, and also this F-16 for, it looks like, the United States Air Force. Then, if you're not in that category, you're going to be in the civil aircraft category. And of the civil aircraft category, you're both, you're going to be one of two categories there, model aircraft or non-model aircraft. Now, notice that at, uh, at the bottom right, that 747 being flown by uh, Qantas, okay, that's a, but well, that is a foreign registered aircraft, but if it was based here in the United States, uh, that, do you notice how Air Force One, it's a completely different type of uh, classification, even though it's the same exact as what's generally flown for uh, cargo or large passenger jets, it's but the, 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 the status is really determined based upon use. But that same aircraft can actually switch hats depending on what type of missions it's running. And there, there's certain benefits to that. So just kind of breaking it down here, um, if you are a civil aircraft, uh, you're going to be either, you know, notice I said model and non-model. Well, the FAA has used these terms very uh, synonymously, but I wouldn't use them exactly synonymously, um, but, you know, generally recreational, we all kind of just refer to it as generally like having fun flying an aircraft outside, even though the, uh, the aircraft might be flying is not a model. Kind of see that distinction right there? Because a Phantom 2 is not a model of like a, like compare it to like a, a P-51 Mustang, you know, World War II fighter jet, which or you know, fighter, uh, or a like B-17 or, you know, F-16 model jet, something like that. So it's, it's, it's better to kind of conceptualize that, but in Section 336 of the uh, FAA Modernization Reform Act, they just use the term model aircraft, not recreational, but it's, it's, it's synonymous, but it's kind of, it's not all, uh, Used synonymously sometimes when precisely speaking with the regulations. Now, if you that this is a basic breakdown and summation of what I've read over everything that FA has said. That if you are uh, want to fall into the recreational category, which has very light restrictions, you have to be. It's it's only an individual having fun. You cannot be a business or a nonprofit or anything like that. You, it's only an individual having fun. If you do not meet that qualification, then you're going to be, you know, non-recreational civil aircraft, okay? And that would be businesses, universities, and they're flying for direct or indirect benefit uh, in any way whatsoever. Um, also, nonprofit organizations flying for their purposes because they're not an individual. They're an organization, even though they may be doing it for, you know, some altruistic reason, um, you know, 
So it's kind of a quick way to break it down, understanding between the difference between recreational and non-recreational, because certain regulations apply, and the FAA kind of turns the light switch off, if you will, uh, with those with the different regulations. So, and John, let me ask real quick. I don't mean to interrupt, but um, are we talking both manned and unmanned at this point? I'm only talking unmanned right now, but the uh, for uh, manned, you have only public aircraft and then uh, uh, just generally civil aircraft. Um, now, civil aircraft can be broken down for the manned side of things into multiple different types of flights. You have like Part 91, which is like recreational flying. They have a whole bunch of guidelines. You have uh, uh, on-demand or charter type of operations, which is uh, Part uh, 135. You have the uh, you know Delta Airlines, American Airlines, which is Part 121 air carriers. Um, and so it, 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 they have their own bunch of sets of regulations, but this is only pertaining specifically to the unmanned uh, unmanned aircraft. Got and how, that's how the FAA is kind of handling this, is what, what I'm talking about here. Perfect, so you. if you are a recreational flyer, uh, then you would have to be flying under the guidance in 91 Advisory Circular 9157A. Uh, and also you should look at the, uh, the 2014 Model Aircraft uh, Interpretation Rule. And in addition to that, the FAA uh, came out with Part 48, uh, the registration requirement, which is currently actually being challenged right now in that, uh, that Taylor v. FAA case, uh, as it applies to model aircraft, but not to commercial aircraft. Got okay. It. So now if you are going to be in the non-recreational category, just generally throw the commercial category, just throw it in the other category. It's probably a good way to understand it because if you're not purely an individual, you know, an individual flying purely for fun, then uh, you're going to fall into most likely needing a Section 333 exemption or a special air within a certificate in the experimental category or the restricted category to actually get operational. And I'll talk more about uh, the Section 333 exemption and what that is. Now, some people have obtained the special air within a certificate in the experimental category. Uh, it's it's a time-consuming and lengthy process, and uh, that's the experimental category. To date, only two aircraft have ever been uh, have attained the restricted category, and that's because they were. Um, it, it was uh, two former military aircraft that were kind of use a loophole, if you will, to actually get a restricted category certificate. But I don't know where in the world you guys are going to get your hands on ex-military aircraft, and that's a whole bunch of paperwork and headaches, and you definitely don't want to lose that because people will get upset. So generally, what 99% of America is doing right now is the Section 333 exemption route. If you're a government aircraft, only for a governmental purpose, you can go get a public aircraft, a COA, and now uh, what everyone calls it is certificate of it's certificate of authorization or a waiver. Really, you're not getting an authorization because breaking down the regulations, there's deviations, authorizations, waivers, and exemptions. And in everyday speak, we would kind of just refer to them uh, interchangeably, and you know, use them interchangeably. But in the regulations, they're completely separate. So. When you actually are getting uh, a COA, you're really getting a waiver. So technically speaking, you should be getting a public aircraft cow, but nobody knows what. You know, it's a misnomer at this point. Everyone, nobody would would know what you're talking about. So just go with it. Call it a public aircraft COA. Or for the civilians, they they have the the blanket COA. Actually, just go straight into Section 333 here. Section 333 of the FAA Modernization Reform Act of 2012 does not even allow or give the FAA powers to do exemptions, actually. What it does give the FAA power is to determine whether or not a certificate of waiver, certificate of authorization, or air within a certif uh, certification will be required. So how aircraft are getting airborne now, uh, commercially or in a non-recreational sense, is that it's like this legal cocktail where they take the Part 11 exemption process and then the waiver process, and then the Section 333 power to determine that a lot of that your drone doesn't need an air within a certificate. Therefore, a lot of regulations do not apply, such as the re regulations that you uh, require you to maintain airworthiness. Right? Just you don't have airworthiness cert cert certificate to actually maintain. So that all goes out the window. You can fly. And to date, there's been about 3,100 uh, granted, and in addition to that, because I said it's it's part of the uh, the waiver process here, you're still going to need a COA to waive three of the regulations. So that's technically how all that works to form this legal cocktail called the Section 333 exemption. So we're going to talk so, more about specifics with schools, but just to be very clear, a school, if they would like to have a, a program, 
commercially, needs both the 333 and the Koa. That, that's correct? Correct. Yeah, that's okay. what I'm going to get into right here because Perfect. you need to understand what you're doing, first of all, uh, as a public university to um, – because uh, then the private universities, they're not going to be able to fall into the public uh, COA category. They're going to be stuck only in the Section 333 route. Okay, but if you're a public university, you have the possibility of actually obtaining a public COA and or also the, the Section 333 exemption, which comes with a blanket COA. So just just looking at the, this, what, this uh, these, these two, two points, recreationally, uh, and it's an individual flying purely for fun with no direct or indirect benefits. So hobby shops, universities, nonprofits, you can't go the the advisory circular 9157A route, okay? You all only have two options. <clears throat> public universities, okay, you have the public co route, okay? And what's interesting there is the statutes are very, very specific, which uh, define a uh, governmental purpose. And the... Flight instruction and education is actually not listed in them. Recently, the FAA put out an opinion letter on this saying that education is not considered a governmental purpose. Okay, So that's, that's hurdle one. So even if you can kind of put your type of operations uh, and get around it as some type of research of some sort, like we're trying to do some type of environmental research, aeronautical uh, research and stuff like that, then you then have to get around the reimbursement process that the, the flight cannot receive any type of reimbursement anyway whatsoever. So if students are paying for that course to then go and like kind of fly under it, you know, that's reimbursement. Uh, so that, that's a tricky area to get into. Now, why would a school want to have a public COA? Well, one big, one big benefit is that the individuals flying the unmanned aircraft are not required to have any FAA uh, pilot certificate whatsoever. They can self-certify, and their aircraft are self-certified as well. They don't have any air within a certificate uh, issues going on there. Uh, so that that's a big benefit to fall into the public COA category because you don't need a pilot's, pilot's license uh, like the Section 333, uh, one of the restrictions there. So that's, that's a big benefit. If you can get that, get that makes your life easy. But education, flight instructing, you can't do that uh, under the public code. So we are left with the last uh, the last alternative there, Section 333 exemption route. Well, Section 333, they, it has been given out for, or granted for certain operations. The majority of the United States, probably I'd say 90, what, 5% of all the 333s given out are just for aerial data collection. And it's defined as uh, uh, any remote sensing and measuring by an instrument aboard the unmanned aircraft, and it would be like imagery such as photography, video, infrared, electronic measurements, uh, so you're doing RF analysis, chemical measurements uh, for particulates and stuff like that. It's basically a sensor in the air gathering data of some sort. That's generally what everyone has. Now, other individuals, such as the first uh, individuals that actually obtained these exemptions, they had closed set uh, TV movie filming. Uh, that's what the, they were approved to do, and only individuals that have actually explicitly been approved for that can actually do that. Well, what's what's the benefit of having that? Well, if you are approved for that, then you can fly within 500 feet of participating individuals. Okay, it becomes very valuable for certain types of operations, such as wedding photography, virtual real estate walkthroughs, and doing the TV movies and the commercials, maybe uh, college, uh, you know, uh, promos and stuff like that to you know get more students to come out. There has also been one exemption uh, granted for 55-pound and heavier operation, another one for crop dusting. There was one for flight instructing. I currently have uh, four uh, pending for flight instructing, but one, not mine, another, another, uh, another exemption was approved for flight instructing. And then another one was done recently for uh, athlete filming. And so that, those are the ones that have been approved, and I'm currently working on a moving vehicle in a night also, and other, other people are working on night and over 500-foot operations right now. So that's kind of the next forefront is night, moving vehicle, 500-foot, and higher operations under the Section 333 So what, what, what we're basically talking about here are rules, or rules regulations that are in place uh, that people just either don't follow or don't want to follow or want permission to not have to follow. So right now you can't fly close to people. You want to include in your 333 exemption flying within 500 feet of people. Is that the basic idea? 
Okay, so going back to the uh, the Part 11 exemption process. Okay, so the FAA views it as that if you're making a buck, all of the, well, really, uh, any direct or indirect benefit, all of the federal aviation regulations apply. Okay, that's difficult to comply with them. So you get exempted, okay, from the part, under Part 11 from a bunch of the regulations. Certain regulations are completely eliminated the need for because the air within a certification goes out the door because Section 3.3 and then the, the last so many, the, the three remaining ones are taken care of under the waiver process. Now, specifically, this 500-foot deal, where does that come from? Well, 91-119 subsection C requires you to maintain 500 feet away, uh, basically above the uh, non-congested area, or 500 feet away from pretty much whatever you don't own in sparsely populated areas. The fixed mirrors are stuck at 500 feet over non-congested, 1,000 feet over the highest object, uh, for the congested areas, uh, so that that's where that 500 foot comes from. Is that that's part of the regulations? The FAA kind of adapted it, and the closed set TV movie filming setup. That's actually part of a waiver process that was developed with the FAA uh, and the Motion Picture Association back in I think it was like the 80s, long hmm. time ago, for the uh, movie filming and stuff like that to get around 91 119. So, like I said, it's a legal cocktail where you have like. A 2012 section mixed with the exemption process, mixed with helicopter waivers from like the 80s. Hmm. It's, it's it was thrown together, and we can fly now. That's kind of how this all came out. Uh, so uh, the the regulations, all of them do apply. The ones you can't comply with, you get them exempted, or you get them waived, or you get rid of them via the section 333 designation that the aircraft doesn't need an air within a certificate. Okay, so that, that's pretty much how that works. If you don't like certain regulations, then uh, you can actually change them. And you don't like certain restrictions on your 333, well, then petition for some new ones. You're just going to have to show that the, the FAA that you have an equivalent level of safety as the regulation. So kind of imagine like a teeter-totter. Mm. So if the, uh, the regulations on this side, on one side, provide a certain amount of safety, well, whatever type of additional restrictions, you know, that you're proposing instead, on the other side, they have to be, at, you know, equal, if not greater, uh, so then... We, we can't that, see you on screen, so I'll, I'll make the teeter-totter. We want it to be even, not this way, or not this way. I can tell that's what you're doing behind the screen there, is it correct? Right, right. Well, you can, I mean, you can make it even more safer, because certain restrictions are difficult, you know, such as the 500 foot between the non-participants. Uh, the close set movie filming allows you to get within 500 feet of the participating individuals, the actors. But still, under your exemption, you're required to remain 500 feet away from all non-participating individuals. And for property, you're required to actually have um, have the permission of those individuals uh, prior to actually getting within uh, that distance. So that becomes very difficult to kind of operate under, uh, because then you, you know, to get permission to fly in urban or suburban environments, you're basically doing like a a Girl Scout cookie set up going door to door, you know, hello, how's it going, you know, can I get some permission to shoot, Do, you know, so it becomes difficult. Now, if you want to get around that, petition the FAA. I'm working on one of those projects right now, how to get around uh, that 500 foot restriction and, you know, just I mean, get around it like, easier for everybody. You were about to share, but how does it, like, you know, let's say you want to fly on campus at your, your college, your university, um, it's your private property, I imagine, or at least you, you control the property, but uh, you're not going to get permission from every single student individually who's around in in classrooms in buildings. Um, so how are schools getting away with that? Do you know? Uh, they're getting away with stuff like that. that. I mean, if they're going out and just filming without a three 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 and complying with it, I mean, there are no three three threes that I know of to date that will allow you just to go straight up flying over those people with the drone. So they're just getting away with it, just like someone robbing a bank. And so somebody who's applying for a three 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 at a university. <laughs> needs to have the closed set as part of their uh, 333 then because they're going to be filming within 500 feet of people. Is that basically... Uh, it, it, it depends uh, on their soft operation. I mean, are you going to be trying to film like a promo that, you know, to make everyone kind of look like you're coming into the area? You know, you know, like you're flying in, everyone's like enjoying being there, pretending like they don't have, a, a you know, a bunch of homework and they're super happy or something. Uh, right. <laughs> if, that, if that's your goal, then you could accomplish that by getting a closed set TV movie filming set up uh, then blocking off that area, making all of those students actors, and then filming it mm. like it was a closed set movie film, but just straight up throwing it up in the air and nobody knows what's going on. 
and you're just flying over the people, then that's definitely not going to be allowed because they're not considered participating people. Right. They're just random people in the public just walking around going, hey, what's up? So and, and that one more would not be allowed. One more clarification. If you're just teaching students how to operate a drone, but you're not filming, you're just teaching them to fly, teaching them basic operations, then you... Uh, then this is it, uh, that particular uh, ramification, I guess, is irrelevant. Is that correct? The FAA allows uh, you to train students, but only if you obtain a flight instruction uh, exemption. To date, only one of those has been given out. Now, if you are training, um, yeah, I mean, are you filming training or something like that? You might be able to get around that doing close set, maybe saying you're filming the instruction of a student mm. because they're an actor. But that you know, it becomes starts getting really interesting and in trying to make these arguments when the FA has started uh, allowing flight instruction uh, to start being done. You know, if anybody needs that, you know, contact me. But I'm, I have four of those pending. One was recently granted, but it wasn't mine. But the FA has recently started allowing that will that will allow you to the individual flying the aircraft who's the pilot in command has to have at a minimum a sport pilot's license and they have to have a driver's license. The student can actually be on the sticks, okay, uh, and flying it, and they do not have to have a pilot's license. So you could be training them you know, as part of some school setup to actually do that. So what what these restrictions here I have on this screen, this is like the common uh, set of restrictions that are pretty much on everybody's 333, that you're limited to 400 feet about above the ground max altitude. You have to have a visual observer. The individual flying the drone, the pilot in command, uh, must be the um, at a minimum a sport pilot certificate. You must have also a driver's license. You cannot fly at night. You cannot operate within five nautical miles of an airport unless you obtain a COA. Okay, so a lot of people think of it saying it's a LOA, a letter of a uh, letter of agreement, or a COA. Even though the exemptions do say that, the you would be busting your COA because your COA, the blanket COA is being given out right now. Have a certain they're they're good for the whole entire United States for two years, but it's for a distance, a certain distance away from certain types of airports and the, the distance away depends on what type of airport. So if it's a towered airport, it's five nautical miles. If it's an untowered airport uh, or, or, or towered airport that doesn't have an airport uh, tower in operation at that point, but it has a uh, instrument approach procedure, then it's three nautical miles and two nautical miles for every other airport after that. So yeah, and the aircraft must be registered and the uh, it cannot be operated from a moving vehicle. Those are pretty much the same restrictions throughout everybody. Now, the whole 500 foot within non-participating persons, okay, everybody that's doing aerial data collection cannot get within 500 feet of the non-participating people, okay, their structures, vessels, unless they are protected. Now, the exceptions to this is if it's closed set filming or you're doing flight instruction or doing the athlete filming. Those are the ways you can get around that, but you have to be ex explicitly approved for those you just can't ask for it and then assume it you have to look at what the exemption actually says and see if you actually were, were granted that and when you file you ask for these things and then when you get the, it accepted then it's included or they will say no and you'll have to exclude certain aspects like that is that correct Cor correct i mean the, the the large majority of people have asked for flight instruction but they have uh, only one has ever been given it so a lot of people ask for it and they go around educate, you know, saying, hey, I, I have, uh, we, we can do flight instruction. I mean, one prime example was, I believe it was Auburn University, was saying, you know, we are, we're approved to do flight instruction and stuff like that. It's like, uh, no, you're not. Hmm. Where did you get that? Like, no, you're not. So I don't know what in the world was going on there. Um, but if you look on the first page of your exemption, generally the first footnote at the bottom, if you ask, it's the first the first page uh, footnote or the second page footnote, if you ask for flight instruction, it'll say, uh, at this, you know, petitioner asked for flight instruction, but at this time, we're not giving out flight instruction. Okay. So that's clue that you didn't get your flight instruction request, and you need to uh, a petition to amend it to ask for flight instruction and, you know, get that actually approved. So asking for it is not enough. You actually need to have a piece of paper with your name on it and the FAA's name on it saying you can do that. So, uh, common myths. Can't fly near an airport. Yes, you can. Uh, Section 333, guys, you just you need to go get a standard COA on top of your blanket COA to fly near airports. You can do that. 
Uh, another one is cannot fly near people. Uh, aerial data collection guys, you can't fly near people, okay? Uh, but if you are doing, um, you know, close set filming or the student, you're the doing flight instruction or you're filming athletes, you can because then they are considered participating people. You have to submit manuals though for those uh, types of operations. It's not just file a petition. It's a petition and uh, manuals. You submit those to the FAA. And that's how you actually get approved for those. And these manuals, they include every detail, every procedure that you'd like to follow. It includes every type of drone that you're going to be using in that instance. Uh, is that correct? Very specific details. Uh, correct. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the FAA uses that part of the risk mitigation process is that you have these these manuals that are standardized so you out there do it. It's you don't You don't miss it. You know, it's like a checklist. And so that's how the FAA views it that you're getting an equivalent level of safety. Remember that, that buzzword back before with the teeter-totter? Yep. So that the manual plus the restrictions and the exemption, okay, teeter-totter balances out to the uh, safety provided by the regulations that are too difficult for you to comply with. Okay. So FAA's proposed commercial drone rules. Now they came out with that back in February of last year. Uh, some of the high, these are some of the points. Now some of those restrictions I just talked about before with the three three three. That's not all of them. Those are just the the, the main points. Just generally around thirty two restrictions uh, that are in each exemption. And of the uh, the notice proposed rulemaking that published, these are just some of them. I'm highlighting. There's more. But it was 100 mile per hour max, 500 feet above ground level. You can fly in Class Bravo, Charlie, Delta, and Echo airspace with ATC permission. Mm-hmm. The unmanned aircraft operator basically takes kind of like an equivalent of a knowledge test. And it's it's the equivalent of a private pilot's knowledge exam. And then you you, uh, you pass that, send that off, and the TSA does a background check about like seven, eight weeks, something like that later. Uh, which... If you're maybe the first guy, it's going to be seven, eight weeks. If you're going to be like, <laughs> if you're like, you know, so many months in, you're probably going to be waiting a whole lot longer for your background check. Then you'll receive your uh, your uh, your unmanned aircraft pilot certificate in the mail. And it's going to have a small UAS rating. So I see they're going to probably build onto this as time goes on. So you might have like beyond visual line of sight flying uh, kind of rating or uh, 55 pound and heavier uh, UAS uh, rating, stuff like that. And, and this the is aircraft proposed. did not, this is not appear within a certificates. This is not in place right now. This is proposed, and we have no idea when this is going to be going into effect. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, the uh, I mean, you and I just right before we recorded this, I showed you that the uh, it had not even left the FAA to go to the Department of Transportation for the Office of Secretary of Transportation to uh, 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 to actually sign off on it. Okay, so it has to go from FAA to the DOT, the DOT has to approve it, then it has to go to the Office of Management and Budget, then over to the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. A whole bunch of people are all intermeddling into that, and, it's the whole, and they have to all sign off on it. If anybody says no, it goes right back to the drawing board. So it's the equivalent of trying to bake, uh, you know, create a Thanksgiving dinner where there's no religious food issues or there's no allergies, gluten-free, blah, 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 you know, all that, and everybody eats it and goes, yum, we love it. You can see that can be very, very difficult and time-consuming. That's the same thing here that the FAA has to do with this regulation. Yeah. Everyone's got to sign off on it, love it, and not be allergic to it or have any, you know, issues with it. And we discussed it. You know, this, this started in 2009, so it's already taken a while just to get to where we are now. It's going to be a bit longer until... Uh, until this actually becomes the actual uh, standard procedure. Correct. Yeah, and then and then here's the thing: these restrictions here. Now, this this these are what you can do under it. Now, what can you not do under it? Well, uh, if you can't fly your operation under Part 107, you can fall back on Part 333. That's another way. It's kind of 333 kind of works like a other drawer in your kitchen. You know, you don't know where to put those keys that go to something. You just throw it in there. Same kind of thing. So if you need to do night flying, you go three three three. You need to do moving vehicle operations, you go three three three. Five hundred foot and pound. I mean five hundred uh five hundred foot pound like what am I doing torque? Uh anyways, um uh five hundred feet and higher, fifty five pounds uh or heavier or hundred miles per hour faster, those are all gonna have to go the three 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 route. So So there's benefit then, even once that goes into effect, of having a 333 exemption, which I believe is a two-year exemption. So once you get it approved, uh, that's your exemption for two years from now. So is that correct, two years? 
Good, yeah, correct. And good for the United States and for, for the entity that asked for it. So um, if you are doing something that is non-107, you might want to look into that 333 thing now for like night moving vehicle operations, 55 pound and heavier. All this stuff I just talked about right here, this is non-107, meaning there is no hope. And by night, my... That you got to go the 333 route for that my, until the FAA um, adds a part 108 or something like that, or part, you know, they, they add on some more regulations. This, and that's going to take a while. So your only near term, by near term, I mean like within five year solution for these operations is falling back on the 333 process. So just to clarify, by night, part 107 is defining night, I understand, by the time of actual sunset. So when the sunset... When the sun dips under the horizon, you're not allowed to shoot anymore. And for photographers like myself, this is a problem because oftentimes the most beautiful colors coming out are the 20, 30, 40 minutes after the sun sets. Um, so you would want to have a 333 in addition to whenever Part 107 is approved at that time, I would imagine. Oh, uh, correct. Now, you want to look very, 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 very carefully at night because night is very confusing in the regulations. You have purposes of night for currency, uh, for logging, for carrying passengers. Within 90 days, you have to do three takeoffs and landings to a full, complete stop. That has to be an hour after sunset. That's not applicable here. Uh, then there is also night for purposes of uh, Part 1.1, which is what the exemption regulation and the exemption actually uh, goes to, which is actually civil uh, civil sunset. Okay, and then for purposes of turning on your lights, that's night, which would be sunset. Hmm. There are all three different definitions of night in the regulations. I only know this because I was a flight instructor and I had to drill this into the, my students' heads. <laughs> so, right. Um, yeah, so for you, under an exemption, it is a civil sunset, which generally runs around 20 minutes or so. You can look it up in the almanac. It's a... Uh, it runs around 20 minutes or so after sunset. Okay. Let's jump into some Q&A. How's that sound? Sure. Okay. So you've covered most of my basic questions already, and I appreciate that a lot. Um, so just we might do a little bit of a recap here, but when talking to an educator or administrator of a school, what's the most important thing they should know about what they need to do? You're going to need to get a Section 333 exemption if you're going to be offering uh, uh, classes for students in some way. If you're going to be doing research, then you could potentially go the public COA route. But either way, you're going to need an approval from the FAA, either the public COA or the Section 333 exemption. You just can't go out and fly uh, in an unregulated manner. Right. And just to be clear, I get this question all the time. There is no charge to apply for a 333 exemption if you're doing it yourself and you're just applying directly through the FAA. But uh, it is highly recommended, and obviously, Jonathan, you're, you're, you're the lawyer who does this frequently. You're always seeing people, obviously not your clients, but other people getting rejected because they missed something, they did something wrong. Um, you know, the recommended route is to just work with someone who's done this before, right? Yeah, correct. Uh, um, I mean, in addition to just um, getting rejected, there's another one that's even more subtle and more devastating is that sometimes the FAA will approve you, uh, especially your petition, you'll ask for things that are incorrect, such as certain regulations that don't even apply. The FAA will grant you an exemption, and if I'm vetting an individual, uh, I can look up their petition and find it and find out how, um, you know, if they're a poser or not. I can quickly look at it and be like, yeah, this guy has no clue what he's doing. Uh, and I've seen that multiple times where the FAA will approve stuff, and it's, it's like a... It's like a memorial to their ignorance or like, you know, it's in another language with a sign around their neck, you know, saying, I don't know what I'm doing. And everyone just kind of looks at that person. No one's going to correct it. And that guy can't correct it because he's too ignorant. <laughs> he doesn't know it. So there are some subtle things like that where um, people that are vetting people just overlook certain things because they don't want to deal with posers. They want to deal with professionals. Right. And the general rule, you know, I, I you know, went through a lawyer for R333 for my company. Um, Talk to lawyers and ask them how many 333s have they gotten, you know? Jonathan Ruprecht, he's an expert because he has gotten... You were number two, number two, right? But you've gotten more 333 exemptions than any law firm in the nation with the exception of one, and you're really close there. Um, and there's only a handful of law firms that have done this. After that, it drops off significantly. So make sure you're working with somebody 
who knows what they're doing, who's done this before, and ask. And I will lead a great segue into John. If, uh, tell us how we can get a hold of you and how we can reach you. And I've got a couple more questions after that. Sure, yeah, you can get a hold of me at my email at john uh, j at jrubecklaw.com or contact me on my cell, 561-222-6979. You can also read uh, my blog, which is on my website at jrubecklaw.com. Another question is about the instructor, which you covered a little bit, but um, if someone is teaching a class using drones, does the instructor have to have a pilot's license if they have a 333? Under the, 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 the exemption given out recently for flight instruction, the individual that is that doing that instruction needs to have at a minimum a sport pilot's license. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and as you mentioned, though, the students do not because they're covered under a co op, correct? Uh, well, yeah, they're actually covered under the. Uh, uh, how, how it works like with man aviation, you have the pilot in command, which is the guy that takes the heat if something goes south. Okay, He doesn't have to actually be on the, the sticks flying it. You can have an autopilot, you can have a monkey flying it, but if that monkey crashes, Mr. PIC is going to get his ticket pulled. So he's going to choose the better monkey to fly his aircraft, right? Make sure yes. that the monkey flies safe. So going to uh, over to the Section 333 realm, the uh, flight instructor, uh, uh, the flight instruction exemption, the FAA acknowledged that the uh, that you just need to have a pilot in command, that the pilot in command doesn't need to be actually like on the sticks. He just needs to be able to uh, take over if there's a situation so that it's not cause an emergency situation. Right. Uh, so the individual flying does not need to be a pilot's license, okay, the student, but the flight instructor would need a sport license at a minimum in addition to having that explicit uh, granting of that exemption for flight instructor. Three more quick questions. One, is a school considered a commercial entity? Because I've heard from other people, uh, someone I was speaking to recently saying that their schools decided that they're, they're may not go the 333 route because uh, someone in their legal team, not a drone lawyer, has decided that the school themselves is not a commercial entity. What would you say to that person? I would say that it, the commercial entity thing actually isn't a, a, like a thing. You either fall into the, uh, uh, the public aircraft category, or you fall into the recreational category, or you fall into the other than those two categories, which generally tends to be commercial people, but not all people in that group are commercial, such as you could have, um, uh, such as universities would fall into that category, such as nonprofit organizations, because they're not individuals flying for fun, okay, and they're not government fulfilling a governmental purpose. Uh, they're not even, and the FAA even explicitly said that flight instruction is not a governmental purpose. Furthermore, they'd be getting reimbursement, so that a public COA is definitely out of the question. And then they can't be recreational. The only alternative left is the Section 333 route. So when people say that, like, we're not commercial, it's like, it, it, you have to have approval to fly. Okay. So whatever you want to call yourself, you can't meet the other two guys, you know, the other two... Uh, uh, set up the recreational or the public. So how are you getting approval to fly? Like somehow you find some little niche that you're like a nonprofit or uh, a university or something, and you get this like pass on all the federal aviation regulations. Well, I've like, got a friend at the no. FAA. I know someone at the FAA. Every everyone knows someone at the FAA, don't they? Uh, you know the FAA is like full of thousands and thousands of people, and what is said at the lower levels, the FISDO, doesn't really matter when push comes to shove. Now, they may be the ones investigating you, and that it's important to know what their tolerances are and what their interpretations are so as you don't step on their toes. But push comes to shove, their interpretations don't matter. The the Really what matters is what's out of D.C., especially the Office of Rulemaking, Office of General Counsel, and the Unmanned Aircraft Integration Office. Those are the ones you want to pay attention to. Uh, you don't Everything else doesn't matter. It, it just doesn't matter. Right. All right, a couple more questions. Uh, let's say my school is within five miles of an airport, so we're in Class B airspace. Um, do I have to call the flight tower every single time I want to take my class outside to fly on campus? Depends on what your uh, your COA says. You get your 333, and you get uh, a, a standard COA for that area. Well, it's going to lay out ex exactly what you need to do. You might need to make a phone call. You might need to file just a no tam. It's it's going to be dependent upon you and the uh, uh, the tower and you know that that particular airport. It's it's tailored, so it's a key. it's not like a general answer. It's going to be tailored. You'll know when you go and do it. Right. You'll have it explicitly like listed out what you do need to do. But the exciting news, obviously, is that schools that are within five miles of an airport can get that permission so that they can fly on campus. 
Correct. I mean, you want to fly at an airport, you can fly at an airport. You just got to get the paperwork. Right. Like, right. <laughs> you just, you just got to ask for it. Do it, you know? We are right about out of time. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that you, you've worked on a couple books. Um, where can we get your books, John? Yes, uh, the uh, American Bar Association book, you can buy it at the American Bar Association uh, website. Actually, all three of the books are listed on my website. If you go to my website, there's a there's a tab right there that says, uh, you know, what books I've done, and it, and it clicks directly into where you can buy them and order them off, uh, you know, off the Internet. Uh, two of them are on Amazon. You can get those via Prime, and they're pr pretty low cost. the The one that be most, the two that would be most applicable to the universities and colleges that they're teaching these classes is that the drones, the many civil uses in U.S. laws surrounding a book, was specifically designed to be used as a uh, as a as like a mini textbook. It has questions in the back, discussion questions that are open ended. So that you can, you know, if, if you weren't, you can ask opening questions. We all know that's very valuable for fostering discussion, even in the really bad days when we had a big something to do the night before and we weren't as prepared to teach as a class. So you can always <laughs> operate. Uh, you can ask those open ended questions. And it also has 402 legal footnotes. So it's very well cited. And the log book, I designed that so it would be good for recreational flyers as well as the Section 333 flyers. Because under your Section 33 exemption and also the blank ECOA, you're required to log your flights and under your ECOA required to report them monthly. So I designed this log book so it would be uh, FAR, the Federal Aviation Regulation compliant, 333 compliant, and COA compliant. Now, I don't go explicitly into explaining the log book how you can use it in all the different ways. The reason I did that explicitly so is I have in the front what is actually required of you to do and mm -hmm. you need to figure that out yourself because a person I don't want to baby people through but it's very very useful and expandable logbook you could even use it and double it as a as an aircraft logbook as well because you could just match it up to the individual aircraft and put your maintenance in it as well mm -hmm. in addition to a pilot log it's very very versatile you just need to sit down and think about it because it, it was created the way it was specifically for unmanned aircraft well, it's a great book. We've been using it uh, for my company here, logging each flight that we do. So I'm grateful for that. Um, and your your other uh, the drone law book, I actually discovered as a textbook when I took a drone operations class at Cal Poly Pomona. So uh, schools are using it as a textbook. Make sure you know each student in the class gets it. It's a great read, and it's one way to get a lot of information uh, in a very quick, short period of time, uh, which is perfect for a course. So. Jonathan Ruprecht, I'm so grateful that you did this. I would like to do more of these with you in the future. Um, is there anything else you want to add uh, just to, to the group that uh, is here today or to anybody who's watching online? I would say just fly safe. Go check out my website. Call me or email me if you have any questions. Perfect. Thanks so much, Jonathan. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me.